I'm always happy to, to be here and, and, and to speak to bankers, although I agreed basically to participate here because I thought that there will be a lot of businesses. So to explain, not so many that I expected, <laughs> but okay, <laughs> we will manage. And again, a lot of attorneys. Uh, it's also uh, interesting because I think that uh, the this is another sector of whom I'm speaking uh, very often because uh, attorneys, of course, right now feel that financial crime is something that makes them uh, very profitable because there is a lot of work to do. So uh, I will try, it's like I always try to not to, uh, to read from the paper, but this uh, today, um, unfortunately, there are so many tasks for me that I should uh, accomplish, uh, including the fact that we have to submit a FADAP report next Monday, but today I'm going to, uh, to some foreign countries. So uh, this means that I have pr uh, prepared something on paper and I will try to be very brief uh, and to explain what is FIU uh, perspective on the anti-financial crime uh, fight and, and uh, or fi uh, fight with financial crime and how we see the de-risking uh, uh, perspective or the dimension. So first of all, of course, we understand that uh, we, FIU and other stakeholders who are involved in uh, implementation of money evil and FADAP recommendations were causing a lot of issues and problems, not only for banks, but also for businesses itself. Because uh, last year when we received the uh, that report uh, from Moneyval, it was clear that the business as usual will not be as usual because we have to change ourselves. Uh, it was clear that uh, from the assessment that uh, until then we were not quite uh, uh, or completely understanding the risks that we are facing. We did not have uh, proper measures in place to minimize those risks. And uh, considering that we had just a year and a bit more, like two months more, uh, where we have to, s to show the positive and tangible progress in implementing the recommendations, we had to be very fast and furious, so to say, sometimes quick and dirty also. <laughs> and that's not always easy. But on the other hand, I always see that as uh, this change is irreversible and something that uh, will make our life, uh, life uh, better in, uh, in the future. So what are the reasons for, for the risking from FIU perspective and also from the perspective of other stakeholders whom I partially represent here because I'm also uh, heading the working group for implementation of those Moneyval recommendations and uh, delegation to FADAP and Moneyval. So I think that it's clear that as Laura was uh, very uh, nicely explaining, it's not something that is just territorial or domestic one. It's extraterritorial, and unfortunately, we are facing the maybe very kind of like intense process, which might be not so typical for other European countries at this stage. But I think that at certain moment, every European country will face something like this. And it just depends on the fact when the FADAF assessment came to their country. And we were having that earlier than some other countries and the consequences are here earlier. So, but the reason uh, for the risking, uh, I think that, or the explanation for the risking is that uh, we should definitely talk about maybe loose legislation and sometimes the same quality uh, supervision, which does not allow uh, the players, uh, the businesses and the, 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 the reporting entities as well as the governmental institutions to always understand very correctly how to implement one or another measure. And uh, in our case, I think that we also have to talk about the uh, US extraterritorial uh, reach uh, or the reach to, to, to other countries. And uh, we know that unfortunately our banks have to comply with those measures that are in place uh, in US and if we want to use the same routes or same, same uh, routine of the businesses and banking sector, we have to be compliant with the measures that are in place in US. And you know, from compliance perspective, but I will not go into details because that will be most probably covered by my colleagues from FCMC, then there was a huge difference in a way how US saw the potential for compliance and how Europe saw the potential for compliance. And I'm always saying that this is kind of like battle of two worlds, 
where one is always sanctioning, have very dissuasive sanctions to the regime, and another one, European uh, Commission, was mainly focusing on compliant internal uh, uh, compliance system, so growing uh, the ability of uh, businesses to understand their risks and to minimize them, not so much uh, concentrating on sanctioning regime. And this is something which I think that is, uh, um, to my understanding, we are somewhere in between, and we are in the, mid, uh, in the very beginning of the road where Europe and US will have to understand how to live further in order not to, uh, not to abuse businesses, not to abuse also banking sector, not to, not to make the life uh, miserable. In our case, I think that um, um, in Latvia we saw the, basically the mix of both reasons uh, or both explanations with this. Uh, there was uh, some issues with legislation, some issues with supervision, and some issues with those uh, players or institutions that saw that the uh, U.S. reach is not so reachable. Uh, and unfortunately, we felt that it's, uh, it's not true. And we have to comply uh, with the, uh, also those uh, uh, rules of jurisdictions that are not so close to us right now. Um, I think that... Um, it is also very uh, noticeable that compliance risk becomes very, very expensive. And I'm sorry for uh, my colleagues from private business who have to spend so much money on compliance. Uh, and not, uh, of course, not only private sector is spending a lot. Uh, this is the time when government is also spending huge money in order to improve all the systems that are in place to improve the enforcement ability to improve the financial intelligence ability and finan uh, financial supervision as well as non-financial sector supervision. And uh, I think that uh, also we noticed that uh, this compliance risk basically is very directly influencing or impacting uh, the, the operational quality of the banks. And we also understand that it's not just about the potential to be blacklisted to be excluded from the market. It's also some maybe not so uh, kind of like noticeable change in the business of the bank or other businesses that, uh, for example, the drop down of the shares um, uh, prof or profitability, uh, profitability of shares and some other, uh, other uh, consequences of this. Unfortunately, with all that what is in the de-risking, we n are not able always to tackle financial crime so effectively as we would like to have. And uh, I think that the result is sometimes very short term uh, and uh, not, as I said already, as effective as needed to be. Unfortunately, we see that uh, uh, those offenders that are here to commit the crime, also financial crime, uh, are very easily adapting to new changes and uh, they are using new systems even more effectively than those who have to be implementing them. So which means that uh, even though we are trying to tackle financial crimes, sometimes it also impacts the real business. The real business that is uh, impacted uh, unfairly uh, and uh, this is something that uh, governments and uh, uh, private and public sector has to think about how to minimize those their risking effects uh, that we are having. From FIU or law enforcement agencies perspective, we are losing those uh, clients, I would like to name them, from the radar. If, uh, if, the, if the business, the good business or the bad business goes out of reach of FIU because it's not anymore banking, for example, uh, then for us it, it becomes very, very hard to tackle them, to find out what the business is doing. Um, and from the, uh, from the government perspective, we are losing taxes, we are losing uh, uh, the employment rates becomes uh, lower, so there are very many different consequences that we do not want to see there. Uh, I will be 
quite a controversial, but I think that it is something that we need to uh, understand here. And I'm not talking about Latvia, but I'm talking about a you know, system as such. I think that the minuses are more than pluses from the system which we are having right now. Uh, and uh, we have to find some more efficient, more effective, more targeted approaches to tackle money laundering and other financial crimes. And of course, it is not uh, possible without uh, cooperation between private and public sector. And I think that, uh, as uh, Ulis already uh, rightly mentioned, that uh, here in Latvia, we are cooperating very intensively, extensively. We are doing that already for the more than a year, and the results are really impressive. Uh, I will just uh, resonate a bit on what Laura, uh, Laura was saying. Uh, it was an end of August when we met on the public-private uh, mm, platform, a meeting uh, together with uh, Latvia Finance Association and some other stakeholders. And I didn't know at that time that we are so successful <laughs> on our cooperation because there was a Jimlet representative, n not the representative from Jimlet, but a representative from Brusi, who was explaining other uh, PPP uh, uh, results in, in, in other countries. And we became aware that we are the second most effective uh, PPP in, in, uh, globally because uh, during the one year operations as a pu public private partnership where uh, uh, some of the uh, largest banks are, um, are participating together with law enforcement and, and FIU is organizing those uh, meetings, we were able to freeze uh, more than 50 millions. We were able to, uh, uh, as the result of these meetings, to initiate more than 10 criminal proceedings. Some other very impressive results. And this is just in one year period. So I think that uh, this example shows that there is a huge potential for public-private partnerships, not only on operational level, but also on the level when we need to decide how to uh, move forward with de-risking, with financial inclusion of businesses, because financial inclusion is always it's like uh, 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 used, the, the, the word for this is used more for the uh, poor uh, people or immigrants or some, some refugees. Uh, to my understanding here, what we see uh, with the very intense de-risking, we have to talk about the potential uh, um, bad consequences to the financial inclusion of businesses. Uh, what are the potential uh, mm, ways how to uh, get out of this situation, which I tried to explain a bit more? I think that, of course, we have to review, and we have done already that, but I think that there is a huge potential still in a room. We have to review our um, uh, legislation. AML law, for example, is something that I already, a year ago when I became uh, head of FIU, I said that this is one of my uh, top priorities, not to just amend the law, but to draft it uh, as a totally new tool for, for us to tackle money laundering and other financial crimes. Right now, with the existing law, what we have, it's not the easiest task for everybody here in the room to understand what is needed in order to comply, uh, what would be the consequences if we would not comply or comply partially, some other issues that are still there and that are causing a huge problems for everybody, including FIU. Um, of course, uh, the change uh, in uh, approach of supervisor is something that is very needed here. Uh, and we are doing it already, and I think that uh, it is noticeable that FCMC is do doing that uh, and trying to implement an um, uh, approach that is really effective and needed here in Latvia domestically. But of course, uh, until when we will know the results of our implementation uh, approaches, uh, the assessment by FADOF will be done, we will not know whether there is something uh, in addition needed or something was uh, uh, needs to be done differently. So this is something which we will be in a process to discuss. And one of the main uh, issues for us, for FIU, uh, together with the, in cooperation with FCMC, is 
really tackle those hooligans, how we call them, in the banking sector, that still believes that despite of what we have done during the last years, uh, there is a potential for abuse of existing financial system. And uh, those who are from banks know that uh, FIU is uh, intensively uh, cooperating with the private sector and banks, uh, not only on those par public-private partnership models, but also uh, by giving feedback to the banks. And those banks who already receive feedback knows how uh, detailed uh, analysis we are providing to them, and they know that by providing that detailed analysis, we are also naming and shaming them, some of them at least, for trying to escape our uh, our over or our sight or far-reaching hand, but uh, I think that uh, this will not for a long this will not uh, be for a long time. This is all the financial sector's uh, duty, uh, not only uh, public sector duty to get rid of those players that still that abuse is something that is allowed there. Awareness raising, what we are doing right now, of course, without that, not only businesses will suffer, but also banks themselves. And um, law enforcement's ability to tackle financial crime, to investigate properly, fast enough, uh, to have uh, effective prosecutions and effective convictions. This is something that we need, and this is something that will show definitely that crime will not pay. And uh, if that will not be there, then unfortunately anything in relation to de-risking or effective supervision or effective financial intelligence will not be enough. And just on final note, uh, because I think that it is uh, like we are losing a bit time and we, um, I, I, I don't want uh, other colleagues to wait. Uh, I think that uh, it is important for businesses and the banks to understand that right now FIU's main target or main focus is on professional money laundering. We are not focusing on those uh, usual businesses or regular businesses that we, are, we understand that sometimes they are not compliant just because they are not informed enough. We are talking about professional money laundering, those networks that are offering on professional level money laundering services or some other financial crime services, and we want to tackle them uh, effectively with the help of international colleagues and with the help of public uh, private sector as well. Um, I hope that I explained uh, uh, what is uh, the uh, kind of like focus of FIU, and I think that. Uh, uh, I always try to explain also that FIU is your friend, and of course, if somebody is complaining, then we are doing a good job. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you okay, a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah.